Welcome to chapter six of the Conduct and Practices Handbook course. In this chapter, we will be going over product due diligence, recommendations, and advice. So first off, an introduction to the chapter. So along with the know your client requirements, registered representatives must also know the products they are recommending or selling to the clients. There's also the know your product rule, and this has emerged along with the know your client rule as a critical component of a registered representative's job. There are many regulatory requirements regarding transactions, recommendations, and different types of products that a representative must need to know. And also, along with the know your client and know your product rules, you also need to make sure that what you are recommending to the client is suitable for them as well, which is what we will be touching on next. So some variables to consider when determining the suitability of the recommendation or investment for the client, you'll need to look at things like, is the security a new issue? How long has the product, company, or fund been in existence? What are the normal price fluctuations of the security or fund unit? This is a really important one since you will need to match the investment recommendation to the client's risk tolerance. Also, what is your research department's evaluation of the security and how do you feel about it? So based on whatever your head office um, is or whatever head office you are with, they will rate certain security securities uh, a certain risk level. And this will need to match with the client's risk level or risk tolerance as well. Has the firm approved the product for purchase? Of course, this would need to uh, be a yes. Are there any additional training requirements in place regarding how the product is to be sold? So uh, this would be things like hedge funds. Um, you know, you need to be an accredited vet investor if you are buying something, uh, a hedge fund or whatnot. Um, there are also other liquid alt investments that do require some additional training. Of course, options and other derivatives, they do require additional training as well. Uh, what is the company or the fund's track record? This is something that is pretty important and you should probably go over this with the client and just see if they are comfortable with a fund or investment that has performed the way it has. How current, available, and reliable is corporate and market information? Is the product considered to be a structured or synthetic product? And is the purchase speculative? So these are all questions or variables that you will need to consider when matching that suitability of the investment. Now, some factors to consider to evaluate suitability. One, does the proposed transaction involve a stock, bond, option, or futures contract? Is it a purchase or a sale? Is the security being purchased with borrowed funds? And if it is, you will need to provide an additional disclosure um, for this. What amount of risk is associated with the transaction? Is it a large order in a thinly traded issue or is there some liquidity risk? Is it a short sale? Is the issue under investigation or review? And is it a hedge to protect an existing position or is it speculative? So again, these are some more factors to consider when evaluating the suitability. Now, there are some rules regarding recommendations. So before you are giving a recommendation to a client, you must give a balanced presentation to that client. You need to disclose all the relevant information, both positive and negative. And in making a recommendation, you cannot give any assurance or guarantees in regards to the following. The future market price of a security, future payments of dividends or interest, the client's ability to sell a security at a stated price other than a callable security, and the listing of a security on an exchange at a future date. So you need to make sure that you do give a balanced presentation when discussing investment options or investment recommendations. And you also make, need to make sure that you aren't giving any assurances to the client that may not be true. Um, 
So things like the market value or dividends, um, of course, because they can be uh, even taken away on a stock. Um, so you do need to keep in mind these things. Now, with the know your product rules, um, here is just uh, a few things that were discussed in the text. So first off, for leveraged and inverse ETFs, these are highly complex and are generally unsuitable for retail investors who desire to hold them for longer than one trading session. Assessing suitability, so registered representatives must use diligence to ensure that accounts are reviewed for suitability and unsuitable investments. So you need to make sure an investment matches the client's investment knowledge, investment objectives, time horizon, and risk tolerance for it to be a suitable investment. Communication with the public. So IROC rules require that sales materials and oral presentations for leveraged and inverse ETFs present a fair and balanced picture of the risks and benefits. And you need to do this for basically any security or any investment that you are recommending. Give both the pros and cons. Supervision. Dealer members must have a supervisory system in place to ensure compliance with applicable IROC rules and securities law. So the Know Your Product rule, it definitely is coming into the industry much more and a lot of dealers are becoming a bit more strict on the rules. There needs to be evidence of some uh, research on the funds that you are investing and you need to know your product. You need to know what you are recommending to the client um, because if you yourself don't fully understand the product that you are recommending, how can you explain it to the client in a way that they can understand as well? There are also some expectations for distribution of non-arm's length investment products. So the following are some expectations of dealer members and their sales representatives. So one, perform product due diligence by learning every aspect of the non-arm's length products they intend to distribute. Two, identify any conflicts and assess whether they can be addressed. And three, assess the suitability of client orders and registered representative recommendations. Now, the following are just more some definitions that are pretty important to understand. First off is an IPO. So when an IPO or an initial public offering is issued, a prospectus must first be filed with the regulators. The prospectus is a contract between the purchaser and the company, and it outlines certain facts upon which potential purchasers base their decision to buy the security. The next definition is reporting issuer. So this is a company that is issuing additional securities into the marketplace. A prospectus is normally still required in this case, but it may be less detailed than the uh, prospectus associated with a, an IPO. And this is because there would already be publicly available information about the reporting issuer. So you can think of it as a private company becoming public, issuing shares for the first time, that is an IPO, whereas a reporting issuer is a company that already is a public company. They are already trading stocks on the stock market um, and they're just issuing more. So uh, some more definitions here. Preliminary prospectus or the red herring prospectus. Um, this must have in red ink on its cover a statement explaining that the preliminary prospectus has been filed and is not in final form. If a preliminary prospectus is determined to be defective or if the information changes, a revised copy must be sent as soon as it is available to each recipient. There's also a waiting period between the issuance of a receipt for the preliminary prospectus and the receipt for a final prospectus. During this period, underwriters may solicit expressions of interest from potential purchasers of the security, but they cannot uh, get an agreement. So anyone who is interested must receive a preliminary prospectus. Final prospectus, this must contain complete details of the securities being offered for sale, including the offering price, the proceeds to the issuer, the underwriting discount, and any other required information that may have been omitted in the preliminary prospectus. 
and a prospectus exemption. The exempt market refers to that portion of the capital markets where participation is restricted to certain individuals and entities who meet certain requirements specified in securities legislation in the province they reside in. Now, next, we're going to look at some exemptions related to raising capital for a company. So first off, we have uh, what's called accredited investors. So accredited investors include financial institutions, governments, regulated pension funds, trust companies, or certain investment funds and wealthy individuals with over $1 million in financial assets. Individual accredited investors must sign a risk acknowledgement form. There's also private issuers. A private issuer is a company with no more than 50 shareholders, not including employees or former employees, and whose securities are subject to restrictions on transfer. Family, friends, and business associates. This exemption allows issuers other than investment funds to distribute securities to the issuer's directors executive officers, control persons, and founders, as well as to certain family members, close personal friends, and close business associates. The Offering Memorandum. The issuer must prepare an offering memorandum in the prescribed form and deliver it to the purchaser prior to or at the time of purchase. Basically, this is a lot like a prospectus, but it is for these other ways of raising capital. There's also a minimum amount, so a prospectus is not required if the cost to the purchaser is $150,000 or greater paid in cash. Now, there are also some exemptions on crowdfunding, and crowdfunding basically just is the process of raising startup capital by soliciting contributions from the public at large, usually aided by online or internet-based systems. Now, the exemptions uh, for this, so there's an exemption from the prospectus requirement, uh, requirements as to how the securities are actually distributed. So the retail investor can invest only $2,500 per investment with a maximum total of $10,000 per year. And then investors that would qualify as an accredited investor, so if they have over a million dollars in assets, uh, they can invest only $25,000 per investment, up to a maximum of $50,000. And investors must sign a risk acknowledgement form. The crowdfunding document must be provided to the investors along with other materials. And investors have a similar right of withdrawal if exercised within 48 hours of the purchase. Now, some more definitions uh, in this chapter, we have resale or first trade exemption. So generally, unless exempted, securities originally acquired under a prospectus exemption cannot be sold until a restricted period. And this is the seasoning period. Um, so this period must have passed. Now, hot issues. IROC requires that during the period of distribution of securities to the public, Dealer members make a bona fide offering of its total participation in the issue to public investors. Private placements. This is um, it is the underwriting of a security and its sale to a few buyers, usually institutional in large amounts. Client priority must be addressed in private placement, and only three days after can non-client subscriptions be accepted. Dealer members must communicate the general availability of private placements to their clients through a statement message, general mailing, or other such communications. Before accepting a client subscription on a particular issue, the dealer member must take steps to ensure that the issuer has issued a press release announcing the private placement first. There's also what's called takeover and issuer bids. So a takeover bid is a formal um, offer to acquire 20% or more of the outstanding voting or equity securities of a target company. So for federally incorporated companies, the equivalent requirement is more than 10% of the outstanding voting shares. There's also early warning rules for this. So an initial threshold prior um, 
to a takeover bid is what the early warning rules are. Any person or company accumulating beneficial ownership or control over 10% or more of voting or equity securities of a class of securities must issue a press release and report to the administrator immediately. So if you're looking to acquire control over 10% shares, you must issue a press release. And then further acquisition or dis disposition of an amount equal to 2% or more of the target securities raises the obligation to issue and file a further press release and a requisite report with the applicable administrator. And you must repeat this until the aggregate holdings reaches the 20% threshold. Now, there are some takeover bid rules. So the offerer must allow securities to de be deposited for at least 105 days from the date of the bid. The offerer must not take up any of the deposited securities unless all of the following circumstances apply. A period of 105 days has el elapsed. All the terms and conditions of the bid have been complied with or waived. More than 50% of the outstanding securities of the class subject to the bid have been deposited under the bid and have not been withdrawn. And there's also withdrawal rights. So anytime before the bid expires, which is within 35 to 105 days, after 45 days from the date of the bid, if the securities have not been taken up by the offer, and three days after the securities have been taken up if the purchaser has not paid for them. Now, an issuer bid is another definition that has been talked about in the chapter. So an issuer bid is an offer by an issuer to security holders to buy back any of its own shares or other securities convertible into its shares. So they are subject to rules similar to those applicable to takeover bids, and the following must be disclosed within the bid. So you must disclose the reason for the bid, benefits to insiders, any distributions of the securities in the last five years, the issuer's dividend policy, and any prior valuations made in the 24 months preceding the bid. Also, uh, there is a normal course issuer bid, and this is an issuer bid um, which is exempt from the provisions of the acts if it is made in accordance with the rules and policies of a recognized exchange. And to be eligible for the normal course issuer bid exemption, the company must prepare and submit a notice of intention to the applicable exchange for its approval. So that is everything for chapter six of the CPH course. Um, basically, it was a lot of definitions, and of course, we learned a little bit about the know your client and know your product rules. Of course, if you guys have any questions about anything in this chapter, let me know in the comments, and I'll try to help you guys out. And stay tuned for Chapter 7.